Good morning. morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Presbyterian Church. My name is Darren, one of the pastors here. It is good to be in the house of the Lord together. Uh, If you're visiting this morning, do want to thank you for your visit. You'll notice in the seat pocket in front of you, there's a visitor's card, that white card. If you take an opportunity and fill that out, you can put that visitor's card in the offering plate when it comes by or return it to me uh, in the breezeway as you leave this morning. Uh, Thank you so much for uh, your visit with us this morning. Uh, By way of welcome, I would like to draw attention and welcome uh, the Dilworth family uh, with us today. Uh, The Dilworth family, Rich, Tricia, uh, two of their kids, Whitaker and Vivian, uh, and Rich's mom, Sheila, are with us this morning. Uh, They're part of uh, one of our mission's partners, and Rich will share a little bit more in our worship service this morning, but so glad that uh, you're with us this morning. Also want to thank uh, those as you walked into the sanctuary this morning. Uh, it, it was decorated last week, but it's more decorated this week. Uh, and uh, I was just thinking through the reality of beauty, right? There's a sense where beauty, all that is good, all that is beautiful, all that is true, is to lead us to our Creator. Uh, and so uh, thank you for those that are taking the time to help us think through beauty Uh, in this Advent season, that it would lead us to the worship of our God who created such beauty. And that's really our aim as we gather in worship this morning. I want to draw our attention to a few announcements on page 16. Uh, One, uh, a little bit of pun here, but uh, you'll notice that our memory verse didn't change. And it's either because uh, your memory needs more help in memorizing it, or my memory forgot to change it. Uh, but we get an extra week with 1 Peter chapter 2, 24 through 25. Um, but also by way of reflection, uh, New City Catechism question 49. Uh, where is Christ now? What a great question to reflect upon as we think about His birth at Advent, right? Uh, Christ rose bodily from the grave on the third day after His death and is seated at the right hand of the Father ruling His kingdom and interceding for us until He returns to judge and renew the whole earth. That's where He is now. Uh, By way of announcements on page 17, uh, draw your attention here to uh, our Christmas Eve service. Uh, We will have our Christmas Eve service on the 24th at 7 p.m. That's a Lessons and Carols service. Uh, it is a great opportunity to not only come and, uh, and worship together, uh, but an opportunity to invite others to join us for that service. Uh, there are invitations on a table uh, in the North X in the hallway, and so please take those invitations to hand to a neighbor, to hand to a co-worker, to hand to a friend, to invite to our Christmas Eve service. Uh, We will gather and worship on Christmas Day uh, at our normal hour of 1030, and so come and be part of that. Uh, Draw your attention to Christian growth opportunities. Uh, This morning, our Sunday morning uh, Bible studies, this was our last week. And most of our growth opportunities, this is the last week for them. So men's Bible study, women's Bible study, community group, all those things uh, will be closing out our fall series. Uh, And then uh, you can note there by Sunday the 1st, uh, we'll we'll begin to help you see what's available uh, for our winter and spring growth opportunities. Uh, You'll notice opportunities to gather right, and to fellowship with one another, uh, and opportunities to serve, right, so opportunities to gather. Uh, next Sunday evening, the 11th at, at 4 p.m., we have a Christmas social, an opportunity to gather, but in that opportunity is an opportunity to serve, an opportunity to put cards together uh, for shut-ins, opportunity for uh, cookie decorating and those type of things. So come and enjoy being with one another, Uh, And the result of that will also be uh, acts of kindness and service uh, towards other things. Also, uh, if you're willing and would like to participate uh, in a service day at George Marks, bringing the teachers and staff uh, a meal, uh, please be part of that. We'd like to include in the gift basket for them 
a $10 gift card. And so if you uh, would like to help provide some of those cards, that's a $10 gift card to Publix or to Walmart. There's a box in the hallway where you can put those cards. Uh, and then on the 18th, an opportunity to fellowship, uh, but also serve by Christmas caroling. And so those are just opportunities in front of you uh, to participate, enjoy being with one another, uh, but also to serve, particularly on the 18th. We'll be serving shut-ins as we, as we carol together. So those are a few opportunities to, uh, to serve in this season and to enjoy gathering with one another uh, in this Christmas season. At this point in time, Matt, Kendra, Lowry, would you come forward uh, with our, and do our Advent reading this morning? Good morning. Uh, today's scripture reading is Luke 2, 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. That was the first registration when Cor Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to J Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. We light this Advent candle to remind us that God sent his beloved son to take on the fullness of humanity in his birth and life among us. Thank you, Matt and Kendra. Let me pray for us, and then we'll stand for our call to worship. Let's pray. Uh, Father, it is that incredible thing that we separate, celebrate. Uh, Father, we celebrate that uh, the one who is over all and created all things became flesh and dwelt among us so that we would know and we would see the glory of God. And so we thank you for that. Now as your people, would you lift our minds, would you lift our hearts to declare praise to your great name. Uh, Father, would you help us to do that through the work of your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand for our call to worship this morning. Our call to worship comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. I'll read the light print. Please respond in unison with the bold. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For the Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who were called, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God.
be seated. We continue our worship together now by affirming our faith together. Today, affirming it from the ancient statement of our faith found in the Apostles' Creed. Please join me in affirming our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into Hades. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We follow our affirmation of faith with a time of corporate prayer of confession. Following that, we will have a moment of silent confession. Please join me now in confessing our sins. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and confess our manifold sins, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life to the honor and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of your inheritance? You do not retain your anger forever, ever, because you delight in steadfast love. And for this we praise you and we thank you. We thank you also that you assure us of our pardon before you in passages such as Galatians 3 in which you tell us that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we now sing, Thou didst leave thy throne. Oh, oh, oh. 
please be seated. I want to ask Rich if he'd come forward and uh, just take a minute and give us an update uh, as a missions partner of their work in North Africa. Thanks, Rich. Good morning. It's wonderful to be back at Emmanuel Presbyterian Church and worship with all you brothers and sisters again this morning. It's been a while since we've been here, and I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support of us. I'm here with my wife and two of our children this morning, so please uh, come by and see us after the service. We read this morning that the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The word of the cross is the power of God. It's the power of God here in the United States, and it's the power of God all across the world. For those of you who don't know, uh, we work now, we've moved from the Horn of Africa, from what is called Somalia or Somaliland, northern Somalia. We've moved to North Africa, to the nation of Tunisia. And uh, Tunisia is also, like Somalia, a country that is predominantly 99 point whatever percent Muslim. And the Lord has taken us there, and we've been working there for the last uh, few years. It's a country that you have to be creative in the way you get in. It's a country that you have to uh, satisfy various government requirements for getting visas and so on and so forth. And so the way that we, uh, that the Lord has allowed us to enter and work in Tunisia is through a small business. And what we have there is a uh, training center. Uh, we call it an entrepreneur training center. And we uh, attempt to train young Tunisians in uh, helping them start their own businesses. Um, it's, uh, it's struggled in the last few years because of COVID. Of course, all meetings and face-to-face -face type things were suspended for a while. We all know what that was like. But the Lord has helped us this last year to, as we've come out of that, to be able to do some more trainings. Uh, we do more than entrepreneur training. We also do English teaching and leadership training and things like that, anything that falls under the umbrella of professional development. Uh, we see this uh, endeavor as something as a, also as an evangelistic outreach. That's one of our uh, three uh, motives, if you will, for this running this center. Uh, we want to meet lots of people. We want to expose them to the gospel. We want to introduce them to Christ and build relationships with them. But we also see it as a place where we hope and pray that the Lord will continue to bring in uh, Tunisian believers, that they too can be trained uh, to start their own businesses, become more effective in the run ones they already have, and contribute to the growth of the church in Tunisia. Tunisia is a country that does have... Uh, a few believers, uh, but they're very few and far between. And uh, as of yet, other than in the capital, there's none that have really consolidated into any kind of a church fellowship. There are a few small fellowships in the capital. We live about two and a half hours outside. In our city, there are only there's only one uh, house church. It's a, basically a family with some relatives, about seven people in all. So pray for them. We also see it, uh, the center, as a place where people can come uh, from abroad and do trainings and be exposed to what missions is like in North Africa. And so those are kind of the three uh, drives, the three motives behind the center. It's evangelism and outreach, it's discipleship and training of the local believers, and it also provides a way for uh, churches in the West and believers and others interested in missions to come and see what we're doing and participate. So pray for our work. Pray that the Lord will use us at that center, our colleagues there. Pray that he will uh, bring the people through the center that uh, he has, uh, that he's working in, and pray that uh, God will use this training center as a, we like to say, a sharp or an effective tool in his kingdom building tool belt. We would also ask that you pray for our family. Uh, those of you who know us know that we have six children. Four of them now are on this side of the ocean, and that's hard on a mother and a father's heart to say goodbye uh, and cross the ocean and not see them for a year and a half, two years sometimes. Pray for our kids as they uh, go through university and get uh, resettled into uh, life in the United States. It's a big transition when you've grown up in Africa and come back to this country. 
Uh, as I've also said, pray for our center and pray for our work there. Pray for our relationships. Pray that the Lord will use us, that we'll be bold. Pray for the local Tunisian believers. There's not many, but uh, pray that God will add to their number daily those who are being saved. Uh, that's the prayer in Acts, and we pray that it would uh, go forth in Tunisia as well. Um, Tunisia is a place of fascinating history. It was a very strong bastion of the early Christian church, but that has gone by the wayside now. Uh, you can actually see ruins, archaeological ruins of old churches, and right next to them huge brand new uh, fancy mosques. And so pray that the kingdom of God would come to North Africa and to Tunisia. Thanks again for this chance to be here, and we'd love to speak with you more after the service, and thank you for this opportunity. Let me come, Let me come pray for you, and uh, if I manage not to knock anything over trying to get over here. So uh, uh, what I'd like to do is let me pray for you. The ushers can come forward, and I'll also give our prayer of thanksgiving um, at the same time. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we, we, we count it such a joy and privilege. Uh, I was reflecting back and just uh, being in a relationship with the Dilworths and the Dilworth family for, for more than 20 years. And so we thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, we thank you for how you've uh, directed and led them and sustained them. Uh, and so, Father, we, and we've been a part of seeing your hand in their lives. And so we want to just give you praise for that. Uh, Father, we pray now for this work uh, in North Africa. We pray that uh, as the center seeks the good of the community around it, as it seeks to train leaders, would you uh, help them to do that well to your glory? Father, would you open up many doors of relationships that many conversations could be had about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, Father, we know that there are uh, your children in Tunisia. And so, Father, we pray that uh, you would bring them to faith, uh, that, Father, you would grow them in faith, and that, Father, the result of that would be uh, from the ashes and ruins of the church of old, would you build your church in North Africa. And so, Father, would she be that resplendent bride to declare your glory uh, and salvation is found uh, in Christ alone in North Africa and from North Africa to the rest of the world. Uh, Father, we pray that you would sustain the Dilworth family. Uh, Father, we do hear the, the echoes and cries of parents' hearts that uh, ultimately part of their sacrifice is being distant from family. Uh, and Father, so we pray that you would keep their family and protect them and, and guide them and direct them that when they are together, they would see your hand and your mercy and your guidance. Uh, Father, now as your people, we have so much to be grateful for. Uh, Father, we pray that as we uh, give our tithes and offerings, we would do so in joy. Uh, and as we do so, Father, would you take these gifts that your kingdom would come and your will would be done here at Emmanuel in the land and from Deland to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
stand for the doxology. continue our series this morning, uh, our Advent series uh, in the Psalter, uh, particularly looking at uh, psalms in the Psalter that are messianic, that tell us about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, and in, in most cases, what they do is they give, a, give us a picture uh, of His kingship and draw out an attribute of that kingship. Uh, and today it draws out the attribute of suffering. So, so let's look together at Psalm 22. Our sermon text is Psalm 22 in its entirety, verses 1 through 31. Let's give attention to the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word to us. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, and you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth and from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue sticks to my jaw. You lay me in the dust of death for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword. My precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of lions. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise Him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify Him and stand in awe of Him. All you offspring of Israel, for He has not despised or abhorred the afflicted of the, the affliction of the afflicted. And He has not hidden His face from Him, but has heard when He cried to Him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform by those who fear Him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek Him shall praise the Lord. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord. and He rules over all the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow down all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord in the com- to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to the people, yet unborn they, that he has done it. The law of the Lord is perfect. 
Let's pray. Father, it is that which we need as your people, that your word, your law is perfect. And oh, how our souls need to be revived today. And so, Father, as your children, we need your instruction. We need your encouragement. We need your guidance. We need your reproof. And if we are not in the Lord and we are not your children, then oh, we need to hear the saving words of Psalm 22 and listen to the the king of Psalm 22 the Lord Jesus Christ. And so would you enable your spirit to that end to teach us, instruct us, and if it be your will, save us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I would dare say uh, that most of you, perhaps some of you, probably have not been struggling as I have with the daily distraction of the World Cup. As a soccer fan... And having grown up in Latin America, in which watching every game of the World Cup was a cultural event, I'm easily distracted. Team USA lost yesterday to the Netherlands and has now been eliminated. Dutch star and scoring the first goal yesterday was Memphis Depay. Unlike most soccer players who wear their last name on the back of their jersey, Memphis wears his first name. I never thought much about it other than star athletes are unique and always finding ways to set themselves apart. But yesterday a commentator mentioned that Memphis wears his first name only on the back of his jersey because at the age of four, he, his mom, and siblings were abandoned by his earthly father. Every game that Memphis plays, the sinful wounds of the abandonment and desertion that he experienced are explicitly on display on the back of his jersey. And implicitly, there are cries of longing that every man has. Longing for the affirmation of a father. But even more, mirroring our longing and affirmation for our Heavenly Father. Undoubtedly, our recent study in Mark's Gospel, when we read Psalm 22, we remember the opening verses of this psalm are quoted by Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In addition, verses 16 through 18 describe in incredible detail the events surrounding the crucifixion of Jesus, His pierced hands and feet, and the gambling over His clothes foretold. The crucifixion and suffering of Jesus are predicted in Psalm 22 and fulfilled in the Gospel. Jesus wants us to know that He is the hope that He is the Redeemer of the nations in Psalm 22 as He takes that on by His cry of dereliction. It's not difficult to see the explicit messianic tone of this psalm. What all the metaphors describe the affliction of the psalmist, right? So all these metaphors that he uses describe David's pain, but ultimately the details do what they tell us about Jesus and His pain and His suffering. Oh, how beautiful, wonderful, and true is God's Word. But as we consider the psalm today, we need to remember that although this psalm finds its greatest fulfillment in Jesus, this psalm is also God's inspired Word at the hand of David, and it was relevant for David It was relevant for God's people in David's day and Jesus' day and our day. One of the glories of the Psalter is that God gives us through it God's inspired words of praise and also words of lament, inspired words of sorrow, inspired words of distress. The Psalter beckons us to express our hearts and the fullness of all human emotions to God. Psalm 22 begins in distress and ends in praise. 
begins in sorrow and lament and ends in joy and glory. It captures the anguish of sin, the fall of mankind, and the hope and the promise and rescue and redemption of the gospel. Although our reflection quote may seem foreign to our Florida weather, most of us understand the harshness of winter and the reality that relief that spring and summer provide. As Spurgeon reminds us, God is sovereign over all seasons and His good purposes are present in every season of our lives, although sometimes in those seasons His presence may seem obscure. Psalm 22 reminds us that God is faithful to His people. He is faithful in all of His attributes in all seasons of life. He provides justice. He protects uh, the people from shame. He cares for His covenant children all the days of their life. He saves the elect from every tribe, people, and nations, and tongues. Most of all, Psalm 22 tells us that although we may feel forsaken, God will rescue His people. He is faithful to His redemptive promises. Our passage divides primarily into two sections, verses 1 through 21 and then verses 22 through 31. But to highlight this dramatic shift in our passage in verse 21, let us consider our passage under three headings this morning. Plus, I'm a pastor, we do everything in threes. Section 1, my heart is like wax. Verses 1 through 18. You have rescued me. Verses 19 through 21. And I will tell of your name. Verses 22 through 31. My heart is like wax. Look at verses 1 through 18. Uh, Although we're not given the particular historical context, King David the psalmist is in a dark season. As we'll see in this section, there's a growing tension between his heart and his head, between his experience and his understanding. God seems far off and indifferent to his condition. Verses 1 and 2 set the scene of David's heart. His heart is melting like wax with an emphatic personal plea. My God, my God. David asked him three questions. Why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? Why do you not answer me? As David looks internally and he looks at the people and circumstances around him, he feels abandoned. Where is the Lord? His groans for deliverance are not being answered. Where is God's saving hand? He is lost in his tears and unable to find rest and unable to find peace. Why is God so silent? Perhaps like David, you may be in a season of spiritual dryness, facing difficult circumstances or even under attack by others. You cry out to the Lord, but He doesn't answer. You groan, but His salvation and deliverance seem so far away. You feel forsaken. You feel abandoned. You feel alone. Psalm 22 gives us God's divine voice to cry out to Him, to acknowledge our pain, to acknowledge our suffering, and our need to experience, and our need to know, and our need to feel God's presence. Look at verses 3 through 5. The eyes of the psalmist turn away from himself and his circumstances, and he looks upward. He remembers God's faithfulness. In praise, King David remembers that God is holy. He is set apart. He is perfect. He is good. He is true. There is no one like Him. He is infinitely divine. He is perfect in His character, perfect in His words, perfect in His actions. He is supreme. David remembers And it paints for us this incredible image that God's transcendent glory and throne are built on the praises of His people. The psalmist is calling us to look up and to remember the Lord. God's covenant people 
Our fathers trusted in the Lord and He delivered them. They cried out and God rescued them. David remembers God's faithfulness, how God rescued His people from shame and from slavery in Egypt through the exodus of His deliverance. As we come to the Lord, we must remember who we're crying out to. Our God is holy. He is all-powerful and all-knowing. He is sovereign and He is faithful. As the psalmist continues to talk to himself and arguing and contemplating, he returns to his groaning and circumstances. In verses 6 through 8, we learn that part of the darkness and the distress of the psalmist is that he's being mocked. He's been despised by others as they, they have considered his circumstances. Like Job, who was told by his spouse and friends that he'd been forsaken by God. Here, David, people are wagging their heads at him because he has trusted in the Lord and the Lord has not shown up. Perhaps you too are experiencing oppression and the mocking of others. You're struggling and seeking to trust in the Lord. But you're being, your trust in the Lord seems futile and being pointed out that it's childish and it's out of step. It appears to all that God has not shown up for you. See again, David's eyes turn away from the mockery around him and he looks up. His downcast heart and experience of oppression are tempered by thinking about the Lord. Note that David now considers his past relationship with the Lord in verses 9 through 11. He remembers that God has been with him from the beginning, that God has sustained him and brought him to this very place and to this very time. As he considers God's sovereignty, he acknowledged that God alone is his help, that God alone is his hope in this very present time of trouble. In verses 12 through 21a, the psalmist describes his enemies. Uh, His own lack of ability to resolve the trouble around him, to resolve his oppression and the wounds and shame he's been receiving at the hands of his oppressors. The strong bulls, raving and roaring lions, the dogs are biblical language to describe enemies, or as we see in verse 16, evildoers. Bulls from the region of Bashan were considered to be the strongest and most powerful bulls, metaphorically describing the power and the pride of the psalmist enemies. Enemies that roared and were seeking to rip him apart like a lion. Unlike our day in the ancient Near East, dogs were not a man's best friend. They were more like the hyenas of our day. They were scavengers, they were predators that would bite and pierce your hands and feet. They roam the city and the city dump, licking over the bones of the dead. The psalmist is powerless to overcome his enemies. His enemies are encircling to finish him off and claim even the clothes on his back. David indicates that he feels forsaken by God because he is surrounded by oppression, by evildoers, those who intend evil, harm against him and God's people. And he can do nothing about it. He's spent. He has lost his form. He's like water or melted wax. He has no strength. He has no sufficiency. He's a broken piece of pottery that has lost its purpose and lost its mooring. Have you ever been so spiritually dry that you feel like you can't speak? Have you ever been oppressed and overwhelmed by your enemies so that you feel like you're being gored by their horn or tore apart by their teeth? Have the trials and difficulties of this world left you defeated and deflated so that you are convinced that there is no hope? Like David, when faced with overwhelming opposition gross inability to overcome the advances of the evil one and the experience of real wounds and real threats of our enemies, how will you, how will I respond? What will we do? Look at verses 19 through 21. You have rescued me. 
David's plea, prayer, has become desperate. He's powerless against his enemies. He's exhausted all his resources. His enemies press in. He has no recourse but for God to intervene. O oh Lord, do not be far off. Come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword. Save me from the mouth of the lion. Here at the end in verse 21, David's cries and pleas are heard. God has not forsaken him. God is still with him and for him. His waxing heart is given form. The horns of his oppressors are stayed. You have rescued me. You have answered me. You have saved me from my groaning. I am not forsaken. The Lord has entered my affliction. The Lord has fought for me. The Lord has rescued me. He has made me triumphant. Have you experienced God's saving grace and mercy? His rescue as David did. Look at verses 22 through 31. I will tell of your name. It just happens so quickly, does it not? The psalmist does not give us the details about how God answers, but David does reveal to us the right response of faith to God's faithfulness, his rescue, his deliverance, his salvation is praise. David's heart is filled with praise and glory for the great and matchless name of his God. The personal cry of verses 1 and 2 has now become a personal praise of proclamation in verse 22. I will tell, I will praise you. God's covenant faithfulness is in the past is worthy of our praise. But His present help, His present answer makes our hearts sing and leap for joy. God is worthy of David's praise. God is worthy of the praise of His people Israel. God is worthy of the praise of all peoples. David shares his praise with others. I will tell my brothers in the congregation, I will praise you. The worship and praise of God are doxological. As a psalmist acknowledges God's hand and presence, he is calling others to magnify, fear, and glorify the name of the Lord with me. As John Piper has once said, paraphrased, we commend, we worship, we talk about what we cherish. We are quick to talk about all the good things in our lives, our accomplishments, yet we are slow to praise God and talk about His saving presence and grace in our lives. Are we not? David responds to God's answer. He responds to God's presence. He responds to God's deliverance with personal praise, with public praise, and praise that invites others to join him, and praise that recognizes that God's present saving grace and God's present saving rescue are part of God's bigger plan of redemption. God has not remained silent. God has not despised the afflicted. God has not hidden His face. He has heard an answer. Those who are afflicted will eat and be satisfied. God's plan to rescue, God's plan to redeem and recover all that was lost, all that is broken, all that was tarnished by the sinful rebellion of mankind against God in the beginning is worthy of our praise. And God's faithfulness to His covenant promises of redemption are trustworthy and true. Because we remember His acts of salvation in the past and in our present lives. It is God's promises and His past performance to fulfill those promises that give us great surety and great certainty of God's power and faithfulness to continue to fulfill all His covenant promises to His people, even to us today. Verses 27 through 28 declare that the praise and glory of God of His redeeming grace by Israel and the sons of Jacob are good and pleasing to the Lord, but they are not enough. All the ends of the earth are to remember and return to the Lord. The nations shall worship before the Lord. All kings and kingdoms belong to the Lord, and the Lord rules over all nations. Psalm 22 explains to us why missions exist, because the praise and the glory of God among all peoples does not yet exist. Mankind was created to be in a relationship with their Creator. 
the glory and the worship of God by all His good creation. To the ends of the earth is why we were made. As God's image bearers, we're to make much of God and display His glory and His rule into all the nations and into all creation. At the end of Psalm 22, it is this glorious aim that all people would worship, bow down, serve, hear, proclaim the righteousness of God to all generations, even to the unborn. How do we respond? In verses 1 and 2, David is expressing his heart. He feels abandoned and forsaken, heightened by his circumstances and the oppression, oppression of his enemies. David is expressing this gaping wound of sin that we each have. The fall of mankind into sin turn God's design and order into chaos. Harmony and purpose gives way to rivalry and shame. Blame, shame, and ultimately death corrupted the heart of mankind, a heart that is twisted, rebellious, and disobedient. Our relationships with each other and creation have changed. But most of all, our relationship with God changed. Due to sin and its corruption, we no longer enjoy access and fellowship with God our Father Mankind no longer walked with God. The deepest aim of God's promises of redemption are to restore us into relationship with God Himself for all eternity. God redeems His people from sin and death that they might know God and enjoy His good pleasure and fatherly love for all eternity. Like a soccer star who wears only his first name on his jersey, our sin, not the sin of our Heavenly Father, who is perfect and holy, has left us forsaken and estranged from our Heavenly Father with deep longings to be reunited with Him into His loving arms. See, this passage calls us and reminds us of our need for redemption and our redemption in Christ Jesus into God's loving arms. You see, King Jesus and His suffering is God's answer for our sinfulness. Jesus is forsaken and abandoned on the cross and in the grave for us. The divine and perfect relationship between Jesus and His Father is severed for a season so that through His resurrection, King Jesus would restore the relationship between the Heavenly Father and His children. King Jesus takes on our humanity, takes on our suffering, our oppression at the hands of our enemies, our physical and emotional exhaustion, our inability to change or restrain our evil hearts. He is spilt out like water or melting wax. He died on the cross to restore us into relationship with God. This is the message of the gospel. This is the story of Advent. Behold Jesus, our suffering King, who redeems and restores us to God. Jesus fills and cures that gaping hole of abandonment, that sin left in our souls. He has written our names in His pierced hands and feet. His name is now written on the back of our jersey. We belong to Jesus. We're adopted children of God. Jesus, our suffering King, has paid our ransom. We belong to Him. When by repentance and faith we come to Jesus to heal us of our sin and restore us to God, then we're free to bring our heart to the Lord. Like David, we're free to call out, to cry out. We are free to express our fears, our laments, our pains, our sorrows, our questions, because we are children of God, my friends. By faith, David cried out to God. By faith, he trusted in God's covenant promises. By faith, he trusted in God's character and saving mercies. And God answered and rescued him. By faith, we cry out to God. But we see so much more than David did. As we cry out by faith, we know that Jesus was forsaken for us. To bring us to God. Jesus takes on and defeats our enemies. 
He shuts the mouths of mockers. He conquers sin and death. Even in our lament, may the Lord fill our voice with praise today. May we look and see His answer, His rescue, His deliverance, His redemptive purposes as He's working in us and through us as His children to sanctify us and enable us to be His witnesses of praise on which His glorious throne sits. That's what we do in worship. Our praises are the throne in which God sits. Jesus takes on our heart to rescue us. Jesus takes our name and gives us His name to deliver us from sin and death so that we, as His people, would tell the wonder of His great name. That's the gospel. That's the season of Advent. We're here to proclaim that we need to behold Jesus, our suffering King, who fulfills all of Psalm 22 for us. Let's pray. Father, uh, it is that. Would you help us to see Jesus? Would you help us to behold our suffering King who was abandoned, who was forsaken, not because of his sin, but because of our sin, that he might restore us into relationship with our Creator and our Heavenly Father. Oh, would that lift our hearts in praise now as we sing and as we come to your table the table of our King today. Would you help us to feel and sense His presence with us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we now sing, What Child Is This?
please be seated. Uh, we have the opportunity this morning as His people uh, to partake of the Lord's table. And these simple elements of bread and wine are a picture, if you will, for us of the redeeming work of Christ on our behalf. We are reminded through our passage today that Jesus experiences abandonment for us. He's mocked for us. He's pierced for us. He dies for us. And He rose from the grave for us so that we might be restored to God. So as we come and we partake of the table, we're saying two things. We're saying that I belong to Christ and Christ belongs to me. There's a personal element of coming to the Lord's table, that He is my Redeemer, He has rescued me, He has delivered me, He is my hope, He is my salvation. But there's also an element of public proclamation because you don't come alone you come and you join brothers and sisters in Christ who are making that same proclamation with you and that's why this table is for Christians this is the table of the Lord Jesus Christ it's not the table of Emmanuel Presbyterian Church and as such it's open to all who by repentance and faith have rested in the Lord Jesus Christ that is that personal confession of faith but it's also for those who are Christians who are under the authority of Christ's church. That's that public element to that. They have joined themselves to Christ's church to profess together as we partake of the Lord's table. So if you're a Christian and in good standing of an evangelical church, you're welcome to partake of the Lord's table. But the table also brings with it an invitation and a warning, does it not? There is an invitation here and a warning. The warning is if you are not in Christ, you need to let the elements pass by. Don't pretend to be something that you're not because they point to a greater reality and that is repentance and faith in Christ. But perhaps you are in Christ but are unrepentant, meaning there's known sin in your life and you don't want to move away from it, you want to cling to it, oh, let go of that sin. And a means to encourage you would be to let the elements pass by and not come to the table, but first repent and move away from sin. That is sin that we're unwilling to repent of because everyone in this room is a sinner repenting of sin. Now, that's what it means to be a Christian. But if you're not a Christian, hear the invitation. The invitation is to come to Christ. First come to Christ and then come to His table. Uh, we'll serve the elements this morning uh, in two ways. You can remain in your seat uh, and Mike will bring the elements to you. It does help him uh, if you'll raise your hand and then he'll know that you would like him to bring the elements to you or you can come forward to the rail you'll be served to the rail uh, families that come forward with the kids that have not yet been admitted to the rail kids will be prayed for uh, and then the elements will be served to you uh, for those who are listening later today this is an opportunity and time to to pray and to contemplate and look forward to the day that you'll be able to be present and partake of the Lord's table together if you look in your bulletin uh, on page 12 uh, in preparation for the distri distribution of the elements here. Um, let us together proclaim the hope of the church. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ shall come again. I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the night that He was betrayed, He took bread and He broke it and He gave thanks. And He said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At the same time, after supper, he took the cup, right? And he said, this is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you for uh, your gift to us, the gift of your table, the gift of these signs, the gift of these elements. They're ordinary, but Father, we pray now that you would, through the work of your Spirit, in, through, and around the elements, uh, remind us of your presence with us and the reality uh, to which these elements uh, point, Father, that we would love Jesus more, for we pray in his name, amen. Stuart, Mike, would you come forward, please?
Father, we thank you for the reminder through these elements that we cried out to you in our distress and the oppression of our sin and our inability to save ourselves. And you answered, you rescued, you delivered, and you saved us in Christ Jesus. We're not abandoned because Jesus has ransomed us. So now as your people, would you enable us to proclaim your praise, to tell of your great name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Good Christian men rejoice. benediction from the floor so I don't have to navigate all that behind me again. Uh, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Uh, if you're visiting, we're honored by your visit. But if you'd like to know more, whether you're a visitor, uh, regular attendee, uh, or even a member, if you'd like to understand more about the wonders of the gospel of Christ Jesus, and that's the conversation that I love to have. Uh, I'll be in the breezeway. We can begin that conversation or schedule that conversation. My time is your time. And so I love to talk about that. But you know what? In this season, we all have reasons to declare the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. So let's be of encouragement to one another and share our stories with each other. Not only of how God saved us, but how He is present and with us now. Uh, that's what Psalm 22 reminds us of. Uh, there are on the table, you, there are some uh, new cards for the Dilworth family, a uh, way to remember them. Sometimes it's helpful to put these on your refrigerator or on a mirror in a bathroom or any other place uh, that will help you remember to pray for them. Uh, they'll be around, would love to greet you, and so, so grateful for taking the time to be with us this morning, uh, encouraged by that. I made a mistake. It's the first one I've ever made. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Yeah, yeah. See how much love there is here? Uh, next Sunday is our last Sunday for Sunday morning Bible studies. Okay, I jumped a week. Okay, and so next Sunday, uh, so hear me. Uh, it'll be in our announcements on Wednesday. Come back next Sunday morning. Uh, there's been a great class on the gospel and on evangelism. So come back and Tyler will be finishing out that class. There's also Bible studies for our kids. Uh, and so come back next Sunday uh, at, at, that's the 11th, right? Yes, the 11th. Uh, and uh, be here at 9.15 in the morning. Uh, and then our break will start. So uh, our growth opportunities in this week and the climax of that ending is uh, be here Sunday morning uh, at, at 9.15 for our adult and children Bible studies next Sunday. Receive the benediction uh, from the book of Numbers, uh, reminded that what? May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace.
Jesus, I see.